Hi there. Um, so yeah, I'm Emily Johnston. I'm in the second year of my PhD at the University of Edinburgh. Um, and I'm studying community engagement for Scottish development-led archaeology. And today I'm going to present on a couple of strands of my research, um, which goes behind this framework I want to create. So I'm looking firstly at the practical evidence, including my data-driven research and a specific case study, and then looking more at the theoretical basis behind my research. Yeah, so some of you in the room already know about my research, and I know I've talked a lot about it before, um, but the aim is to create a matrix of engagement for community engagement in development-led archaeology. Um, the focus of my research is Scotland. Um, Scotland is pretty unique um, due to its legislation, um, but then also numerous strategies in place for engagement, some of which are here on the board. Um, and there's also many third sector initiatives and organisations and public bodies obviously doing a lot of active um, work in the sector, as well as um, over 100 societies and community groups that are composed of amateur archaeologists doing some fantastic work. Um, so for my framework, um, in order to inform these future practices, I thought it was first important to establish the past practices as well as what's presently going on. So when I started my research, I just wanted to find a simple statistic, and it's never as easy as it sounds. Um, I just wanted one statistic for how much uh, community engagement commercial companies are involved in. And yeah, couldn't find it. So I started to data mine Discovery and Excavation Scotland, and I've gone back um, across the last 22 years, so dating back to 2000. Um, and I was data mining for keywords such as volunteer, community, outreach, and public. Um, I then supplemented that information with project reports um, and then internet searches as well. So m for my research, I take a kind of macro to micro approach. Firstly, looking at the broad trends across Scotland uh, for community archaeology in general, and then narrowing it down systematically to commercial um, endeavours and then specifically the developer-led practices. And this approach has given me a really sound understanding of the types of activities occurring across Scotland, as well as the audiences and the appetite for community engagement. So I've created this database um, with um, all these projects, over 650 projects and activities now. Um, but whilst I've been collecting this information, it's really highlighted a lack of archival data on community archaeology projects as well as huge, uh, stark differences in the different recording and evaluating of, of activities. And one of the hurdles that I keep coming up against is that lack of data outside limited published case studies. So the data that I've been collecting, I'm hoping to turn into an accessible online resource for the sector. Um, I've got funding from the university for this, and I hope to launch it in early 2024. So keep your eyes open for that. Um, it'll be an open access resource which will have an interactive map with all the different activities as well as key term searches as well and it'll help to showcase the breadth of projects and practices across Scotland. Um, I'm hoping that this will become a really valuable resource for the sector providing some empirical data uh, which can then be used by researchers and practitioners and as such these metrics can then help to aid discussions such as on government backing or um, funding for community outreach. So yeah, keep your eyes peeled for uh, January, hopefully. Um, so at my current stage of research, I've started to analyze some of that data that I've generated. I'm using 2022 as a general cutoff at the moment. Um, and for today, I thought I'd highlight some of the trends that I've come across. Um, before I start, I'd like to just say it's only a small snapshot of the trends that I've found so far. Um, I don't want to bore you with too many graphs on the screen, um, but I would be happy to um, explore any of this further if you'd like to talk about it. Um, I also just want to note that for the sake of keeping this brief and on time, a lot of the nuances can't be fully explored here. So I've made some broad groupings, which in my research I do break down further. So. Um, so to begin with, um, on the screen you'll see projects that are mapped according to their local authority area. The bar chart shows a breakdown of the different local councils and as you can see there's a lot of variation between the areas and this can be attributed to a huge amount of reasons. But um, for today if we just look at the Highlands because that's got the largest number of projects. Um, 
whilst the Highland area has the largest land mass, it also has the lowest population density for Scotland. The higher number of activities here may be a reflection of the large areas of undeveloped land, which allows community groups to utilise it for archaeological investigations. And then this high number of activities does not reflect the number of development-led activities, so, which is expectedly lower for this area. But also in the Highlands, many um, different initiatives and organisations can be attributed to the area, such as just a few on the board here. Um, you've got the archaeology for the communities in the Highlands, which are um, hosting a huge number of opportunities. Um, there's community initiatives such as Historic Ascent, um, archaeological societies such as NOSAS. For example, NOSAS, or North of, sorry, North of Scotland Archaeology Society, was formed in 1998 and has hosted a huge number of surveys, field walks, excavations and projects. For example, right now they've got the Taradale Through Time project, which is a multi-year funded project through the Heritage Lottery Fund. And it's given the opportunity for the community to engage in archaeological survey and excavation. And through this project, they've created a huge number of materials such as YouTube videos, blogs, um, and even a publication. So the works of these and many other groups are going to be interrogated a lot further within my research. So hopefully I can show a good range of uh, projects. Um, if you look at the type of different activities occurring in Scotland, I've got a bar graph on here which breaks it down into the different groupings. Um, the most common type of activity is excavation with 346 including an excavation component and then a further 245 of these have some sort of survey element as well. Um, one thing I found interesting was there's a relatively small number of projects which include field walking or recording, which I don't actually think reflects the, um, what's actually happening on the ground. Um, these activities don't require specialist equipment a lot of the time, so I thought these would represent a lot more activities. But I think that this might represent a bias in reporting and data collection as well. Um, looking towards the yearly trends, I've mapped um, the projects on, on the graph. Um, so this displays information from 2000 to 2022. And in my research, I've looked at each of these peaks um, for numbers. And some of the reasons behind the peaks are here on the board. Um, so the peak of activities occurs in 2017, where I've managed to record 130 projects for that, or activities for that year. And this coincides with the Scottish Government designated year of history, heritage and archaeology, which increased public involvement opportunities. And it was also the launch of Digit 2017, um, which um, encouraged many more opportunities as well. And then, of course, there's a severe drop here, which is to be expected in 2020, 2021, when obviously the COVID restrictions uh, resulted in the nationwide lockdown and then tight social distancing, which limited the capacity and ability to hold in-person events. Um, whilst I've been uh, collecting this data, I've also looked at some of the other um, activities or outputs that projects and activities have had. So I've created four categories, uh, formal training, um, creation of accessible training resources, schools involvement, and if there's been a site tour or open day on offer. So these pie charts on the screen show the percentages of projects with and without these supplementary activities. And this data has been further scrutinised to reveal that there is a statistically significant relationship between the projects that develop these outputs or extra activities and those with professional involvement. So to move on to the types of involvement or professionals, um, I've uh, grouped them according to the organiser and then whether a professional has been involved in any, at any stage. So organiser has been categorised um, in the subcategories of public sector, private sector, third sector, community led and society led, as shown on the bar chart here. Um, again, I've looked at these groupings a lot in a lot more detail in my work. But I've further grouped the types of professional involvement um, and of the 600 and 59 projects that I've explored in my research, 516 have had professional involvement at some stage within them. 253 of these projects have been supported specifically by the commercial sector. So if we look towards the commercial sector briefly here, 
Um, this is where my PhD research starts to interrogate the commercial sector a lot further to understand that relationship between community engagement and professional archaeology. And I've also started looking at the benefits that can be generated through these relationships and activities. Briefly here, I just thought I'd highlight that I've categorised types of involvement by commercial companies into four broad settings. So research or community projects, community-led projects, big digs, and then developer-led engagement. So I've looked at these groupings in a lot more detail with case studies, but the most pertinent to my research is that developer-led context, which I have examined to a greater depth, but I won't explore today for you. Um, a case study that I will draw upon, though, um, is the Holyrood Field School. So as well as developing data-driven research, I've also been putting theory into practice by implementing a variety of engagements in a real-life setting. I'm the outreach officer for the Holyrood Field School, which is a partnership between the University of Edinburgh and AOC Archaeology and is supported by Historic Environment Scotland. The Field School is currently training current university students with excavation techniques which will prepare them with the skills for careers in commercial archaeology. This helps to demonstrate some of those tangible outputs from commercial partnerships. In 2022, the excavations commenced at Dunsapi Hillfort, which is a popular dog walking site for local Edinburgh residents, and it sits in the shadow of Arthur's Seat, which receives a huge number of local and international visitors daily, and particularly during the summer season, which is when our season was. So as we knew that the site would receive a huge amount of interest, I, along with one of the project directors, John Henderson, developed a strategy for engagement. So for, yeah, for the 2022 season, this was primarily online engagement. Um, this included social media posts and daily blog posts. We were featured on an episode of BBC's Digging for Britain. And throughout the season, I filmed and edited YouTube videos. We used videos and social media to present some of the key finds during the digging season in a manner that was digestible to the audience, both close to home and further afield. And for the coming 2023 season, we're looking at expanding this further with more in-person engagement, including an open day, so please do come along. As you can see on the board, uh, this is just some of the examples of engagement um, that we did. And you can see that some of them did receive a huge number of views as well, something which we're hoping to build upon for the coming season. Within this role, it's been really important to understand the different audiences who are interested in the site using audience mapping techniques in order to develop relevant engagement for them. So additionally, it's also been beneficial to my research to understand the cost time factor that goes into different engagement and how this can then be most effectively used in different settings, such as the development led. So for, um, sorry, uh, so for my actual research, which has the aim of creating this framework of engagement, I've been using practical examples such as the Holyrood Field School, as well as my data-driven research and then one of my goals is to create this matrix. So the data analysis, which is working from a macro view down to the micro view, provides a scaffolding for my research. By understanding national and regional trends in community archaeology, it's possible to then overlap, uh, map the overlap sorry, between community initiatives and any commercial endeavours. And this can help to provide clear understanding of the factors influencing community engagement. So it's been essential to establish the context in which the commercial sector operates and I've been shown acute awareness of legislation and strategies in place as well as these current practices. As a result, it's then possible to create this matrix which shows awareness of the different contexts and abilities and then can be effective in practice. So going forward, I'm now starting to look at interrogating different techniques for engagement and understanding their suitability for different settings. Um, so within my research, I use the term multidisciplinary a lot, um, and this is because I believe that in order to understand engagement, we also have to look out with the archaeology sector. Much of the engagement and community archaeology practices that have occurred have been traditionally practice-led, and it's only recently that we're actually starting to examine the structures that are in place which encourage the engagement. And for most of the research at the moment, it's, there's a lot of emphasis on the value behind it and understanding the audiences. So my research aims to examine interactions through other fields of research, such as education and psychology. 
And in doing so, I'm interrogating the different motivations for engaging with archaeology and then understanding these different approaches for engagement. And I'm hoping that this will then contribute to the wider discussions of value and what constitutes meaningful engagement and then provide a theoretical base from which we can develop approaches. And by doing so, this research will establish a theory-driven approach to engagement, which encourages the creation of sustainable and meaningful interactions for the public. So to conclude, um, I've highlighted here the ways in which I aim to amalgamate theory and practice within my research for this framework. Um, by analysing the past practices and developing an archival resource for the sector, my research establishes a grounding from which to develop new practices. This pre preliminary analysis of data has provided an overview of the structures that are currently in place and highlights the breadth of practices and interest across Scotland. By synthesising the data in this way, the database has demonstrated a lack of data and differences in reporting methods. So the aim of my database, which will be continually contributed to, is to provide an archive as well as an up-to-date resource which showcases the work of professionals and enthusiasts across Scotland. And by examining the different schools of thought and practice, it'll be possible to develop a robust and effective framework through which new practices can then be highlighted and encouraged. So going forward for my research, I now aim to start interrogating the techniques for engagement, understanding their suitability for the different settings for commercial archaeology, so that my contribution for this field is practical, adaptable and enduring. Thank you.